awesome. Yeah, like, I, I was lucky because, like, one of my school classes got canceled, and then, like, the other one was short. Like, was oh, wow. So, welcome to Law and Order Zootopia. I am Scuffles uh, the Rat. This is Boozy Badger, and we are here to talk to you about criminal law in Zootopia. Now, before we get started, there is one thing I have to say because I am required to. This, is, this panel is for entertainment and educational purposes only. It is not legal advice. If you are in need of a professional legal opinion, you must consult with a private attorney and retain their services. This is just a broad overview of the law as of what may relate to certain jurisdictions and certainly not necessarily your jurisdiction. And every jurisdiction is different, so beware. Your mileage may vary with what we're about to say. Before he continues, how many of you are Pennsylvania residents? All right. If you have a specific legal question, see me afterwards for a business card. <laughs> <laughs> so as I said, I'm Scuffles. I've been practicing for 10 years now. I've spent most of my career in prosecution. I was an appellate clerk for two years, and I am just about the most adorable lawyer you will ever see. <laughs> oh, I have to do my own introduction. Well, I mean, I... Uh, according to his PowerPoint, I am boozy, I do lawyer things. <laughs> <laughs> I am also adorable, according to this, and I have a tattoo of Kentucky. You, you mentioned the tattoo of Kentucky, but you leave out the tattoo of Lady Justice on her knees. <laughs> That's a real thing, by the way. <laughs> well, so we are going to be talking about two different criminals in Zootopia, or I guess alleged criminals, if you're being technical. And those are Leonardo Lionheart, the mayor, and Doug. Doug is the ram who is making, allegedly, uh, chemicals of the Night Howlers. And these are our two defendants. And each of these defendants in the course of Zootopia is arrested at some point, uh, and they are presumably tried in a court, and something happens to them. The first thing we have to talk about a little bit is what law applies here. Uh, we don't exactly know what law applies in Zootopia. There are some hints as to what happens. For instance, uh, at some point, Nick says to Judy, you can't go in there without a warrant. So we know on some level warrants are required for certain searches, but for the purposes of this conversation and the panel we're having, we're going to assume that the federal rules of evidence and that the federal constitution of the United States of America applies. And so since in this country, every single person, regardless of what state they in, are in, has a minimum level of protection of the US constitution. That's because the 14th amendment said that every single one of you is protected by the federal constitution even within your state. So the Fourth Amendment is the one most people are familiar with with the context of searches and it's basically what we're going to talk about in this panel. And the Fourth Amendment says the right of the people to be secure in their person, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Can everybody hear me, or should I use the microphone? Tell them to shut, shut up and oh, I'm going to go ahead and use the microphone. This may be a little bit easier. So let's start with Leo Lionheart. And if I had been able to use this, you could have seen I had a nice flow chart. This was truly a life-changing PowerPoint. I mean, yes. <laughs> it had flowcharts. You were all poor for not being able to do it. Write your congressman. So to understand how someone is prosecuted and how someone is defended, you have to understand how they came into the criminal justice system. So that means you have to understand a little bit about the investigation and how it proceeded. So how was Leo Lionheart eventually arrested? The investigation starts the Naturalist Society where Judy and Nick find out that Otterton, the person who is missing that they are searching for, was a regular there. And that he had been picked up by an SUV, and he had, they get the uh, license and registration number. They go to the DMV, they pull the license number, and they follow that to a truck yard. In the yard, there's a fence up, 
They don't have a warrant, and Judy enters without a warrant. She presumably has some sort of cover that she is trying to track Nick down because she throws the recorder over and he goes for it, but ultimately she enters into the truck yard without a warrant. She searches an SUV, she finds evidence of a struggle, and she finds that the SUV is owned by Mr. Big. She, go, she is then kidnapped by Mr. Big, who takes her and she finds out about Mr. Machias, the driver of limous the limousine that had picked up Mr. Otterton. While there, during the course of that, Machias goes feral and attacks them. Machias goes missing, and they view and see video recording of two wolves kidnapping Machias, taking him, and going through a tunnel that they then follow and find the laboratory where they again search without a warrant and they find the missing animals. Leo Lionheart shows up later, they confront him, and he is arrested. And that's how we get to where we are now. <clears throat> so there's a couple things that happen during the course of this. First of all, we know that one of these searches is an illegal search. The search they do of the car, of the SUV, that leads them to Mr. Big and eventually to Mr. Machias is a search without a warrant. And as a prosecutor, even though it's my job to try to defend some police actions, I can just tell you right now, this is not something I would be able to defend. There are no circumstances in this case that would lead them to need to search without previously getting a warrant. There's no indication that those cars are going anywhere. There's no reason to believe that that evidence is subject to quick destruction. So they needed to get a warrant. Judy actually says the words, I don't need a warrant if I'm uh, investigating a crime. That is an exigent circumstance. And it is if you are following something, you see a crime in action in a place, you can go in and stop it. However, the Supreme Court has held repeatedly that the police cannot create an exigent circumstance for the purpose of evading the warrant requirement. And on that note, an exigent circumstance itself isn't enough. Uh, police actually need two things with an exigent circumstance. First, they need probable cause of a crime, and then second, they need the exigent circumstance. So in this case, even if they had probable cause, there was no exigent circumstance. So there was no reason to search. So, Boozy, do I lose at this point? They've searched illegally. Do, do you lose the whole case, or do you lose if you're trying, like most dumbasses with prosecutorial badges, to bring in the evidence? <laughs> do I, can I bring in the evidence that follows from the illegal search? So Absolutely every, not. Okay. Well, you're wrong. <laughs> well, you're, you are more specific, counsel. What evidence are you looking to bring in? <laughs> Everything that follows from the limo search is the limo search. Oh, everything that follows from the limo yeah. search? Are no, you, you can probably get that. Yeah, because who's the who is the owner of the limo? Mr. Big. Mr. Big. Who's the man we arrested? Leo Lionheart. There's a concept in the law called standing. You only have standing to challenge illegal searches of your stuff. The concept is that a, uh, the Fourth Amendment is crafted to protect your reasonable privacy interest, reasonable and legitimate privacy interest in your property and person, mm -hmm. not other people's. If somebody searches your friend's car and finds your drugs with your address on it because you're a dumbass, <laughs> you don't have the standing to challenge the search of your friend's vehicle. You have no legitimate privacy interest in somebody else's property. You also don't have any legitimate privacy interest in drugs, but. So the investigation proceeds and continues. And they follow their leads to Machias, which follows them to the lab. And then they search the lab again without a warrant. And so again, we're faced with the question, can they legally search the lab? Now, there's a lot of things that can intervene in this, but for the sake of giving us both something to talk about, we're going to assume right now that the laboratory is owned by Leo Lionheart, that it is Lionheart Industries. It turns out that the mayor was a big, comes from a big pharmaceutical family, and that's how he got his fortune, and that's how he bought his way into power, and that's how he afforded to retain Boozy. Uh, I guess Johnny Cochran's been dead for a while. So let's say that the lab belongs to Leo Lionheart. So now he does have standing to challenge the search of his property. 
Is this search illegal? Can I use evidence found from this search? So I want to hear your response first. Can he get the evidence in? Everybody. Can he get the evidence in? Uh, I would say yes, due to the fact they witnessed the kidnapping via. Oh, but did they? No, they the, via the recording. Because then that could be doctored, so therefore it's subject to challenge. I will say no, and I know what this asshole's going to say. <laughs> but I, I will say no. And I will tell you no. They did not witness anybody go into that lab. They witnessed a vehicle go down a road that may or may not have led to that lab. They had a reasonable belief that he may be in the lab. However, what proof of danger was there that the person had died? That video was several days old at that point. Do you have any in, any indication whatsoever that somebody is in reasonable danger of the destruction of evidence necessary to overcome the exigent circumstances such that they could avoid the warrant requirement? What stopped Judy from going to a magistrate, having a warrant signed off on, presenting an affidavit with that evidence, and going in? Any harm that had occurred had already occurred. Any evidence that had been destroyed had already been destroyed. There were guards on the place. There was nothing stopping them from getting the warrant whatsoever. Well said. You're still probably going to lose. <laughs> your, time, your timing is off. Because from the time that he, she handcuffed him to the post until uh, Chief Bogo showed up was quote unquote we minutes. We don't know they were at the lab. We don't, we don't know if there was any danger going on. And we don't even know why Judy couldn't just call and get a phone warrant, which is a thing. Oh, I know. I've got it in the system. So... Oh, no, that doesn't stop you from making a phone call, sir. And by the way, she wasn't in the system. How'd she get access to the 1040s? 1040s. Nick Wilde. Oh, we can't even get Trump's 1040s. You have a dirty cop, sir. Taxes, are fed taxes can I be mean, federal, though, not city. Look, I recommended charges against Judy Hopps. What the district attorney does is not my call. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to want Judy Hopps to testify as to what she witnessed on that video. What created your circumstance? One, one point, though. You said, is there anything linking the kidnapped Mr. Montrose to Cliffside? Right. Just the road. Just the road. If I see so, if I see a car going under this convention center, basis, does that give me a reason to break into somebody's house and film the other side of the convention she center? She saw Timberwolves kidnap him on the video. She saw the same Timberwolves. That, doesn't over, that does not overcome the exigent circumstance, though. Just the fact that there's, the there's just the fact the that there's probable evidence of a crime, because the argument is not, is there no probable cause whatsoever? It's, is there a circumstance that overcomes the warrant requirement? The law is very particular about that. The warrant requirement is what the Fourth Amendment puts into place. Okay, so if a police officer believes you have drugs in your house, and they don't believe that you're getting ready to destroy them. Could a cop, by watching you walk into the house with drugs, then kick in your door and take them? No. What the officer could do, and what most officers do do in that point, is call in, get a phone warrant, which is where they relay the information to another officer who writes it in a written form, drives to the closest magistrate that's on duty. The magistrate reads it or takes the testimony, signs it, hands the warrant to another officer who calls back and says, okay, we got the warrant. And then they go in from there. Probable cause just creates the requirement for a warrant. Without the exigency, you still have to get that warrant. So in this case, what a criminal lawyer is really arguing against is not, was there probable cause? Was there something that could lead you to believe that there was a, a criminal activity taking place inside the building? But was there an exigency or not that allowed the police, in this case Judy Hopps and Nick Wilde, because he was acting as an agent of the police in this circumstance, uh, to avoid getting a warrant before entering. If the answer to that is no, anything they find inside could be subject to suppression. I mean, it would not be introduced, mean uh, Mr. Lionheart, Mayor Lionheart, without something else, would walk. One other point, though. Chief Bogo did not charge her to arrest anyone. He charged her to find the missing mammals. She did not know she was going to find Leodore Lionheart or anyone that else. That doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, but that, she wasn't interested in an arrest. She just wanted to find the missing mouse. Intent doesn't matter in terms of what they do. Only their actions matter. Which so, gets a lot harder to be asked, but she still did what she said to do, which was find the missing mouse. Uh, I mean, correct, but then, you know, 
the mayor walks free and you have an officer violating Fourth Amendment rights. So a happy ending. Twice in one day. <laughs> the, the hero. So an exigent circumstance is defined as circumstances that would cause a reasonable person to believe that entry or other relevant prompt action was necessary to prevent physical harm to the officers or another person, the destruction of relevant evidence, the escape of a suspect, or some other consequence improperly frustrating the legitimate law enforcement efforts. And so what you're seeing here is basically how we craft our arguments. Boozy is coming up with his best argument, which is that while there was probable cause, there was no exigency, primarily because so much time had elapsed between what they watched on the video and what they saw, and also because they never see Machi as being unloaded, that there is actual doubt as to whether or not they could still say that there was an exigency that existed. I'm still probably going to win, yeah. because while that's a very good argument, the presence of people, and particularly kidnappings, oftentimes extend in exigencies because we want to give people, the uh, officers, the ability to try to rescue people. And so even in circumstances where a day or so might have passed, we are going to most likely lean on giving them the exigency, and additionally there is a concept called good faith, and that is that if you can show the officers reasonably believed that under the circumstances they had to go in, even if you find that there is evidence to believe that they shouldn't have thought that, if they were acting in good faith, they weren't acting explicitly to violate the Fourth Amendment. It's amazing can, how many officers are acting in good faith. Yes, you can still get it in. King versus Kentucky is a good case on that and on the creation of exigency. The Supreme Court has been very clear, a police officer cannot create an exigency. So a cop can't create a situation that would allow them to avoid the warrant. Uh, in King versus Kentucky, two Lexington police officers witnessed a drug deal. The drug dealer walked back to his apartment. They followed him. They did not know which one of two doors they went. The drug dealer went in, so they knocked on the other door. They said when they knocked, they smelled marijuana burning, which I'll tell you what, our police have noses like bloodhounds because somehow they can smell marijuana five rooms away through a locked door with a ventilator running if you ask them on the stand. I'm sorry, have you actually been upstairs in the Westin recently? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but in that case, they knocked on the door, they heard, they announced themselves, which knock and announce is a very standard procedure with police. Uh, it's when you see in the movies, police open up, that is called knock and announce, okay? They knock, they announce themselves, they heard people moving about, they kicked in the door. They found marijuana, they arrested everybody in the apartment. The argument in King versus Kentucky, A, it wasn't the drug dealer's apartment. That was the first thing. It, it, and it wasn't. The drug dealer had gone to the other apartment and actually did destroy everything there while they were raiding his neighbors for like, I think, four joints worth of marijuana. Um, that the, the, that was the wrong apartment. Uh, the court kicked that and said, well, they smelled marijuana, so at that point they had reasonable cause to believe that there was something going on in that apartment, which would give them the reason to knock and announce. Reasonable cause and pro or reasonable suspicion and probable cause, two different things. Okay, reasonable suspicion is, I believe there may be criminal activity going on, and that's just enough to get an officer to a point where they can uh, take steps to investigate. It's not the same as searching or seizing, just mere investigation of it. Uh, when they knocked and heard people running around, now that coupled with the marijuana gave them probable cause there were drugs or illegal activity taking place inside the apartment. The running around, the exigency they got, was they said people will start flushing the toilet. The argument was had the police not knocked, had they just at that point called for a warrant, they wouldn't have created an exigent circumstance. They would have had enough to probably get the warrant, but they wouldn't have created the exigent circumstance, and by knocking they created it, and therefore everything should be shown, thrown out. The Supreme Court said no. When you have enough that you could make the knock to ask the question, we're not going to view it as a created circumstance, even though you know the second you say police, they're going to start flushing shit. Back to what he said about intent not mattering. I think we should get into the statement. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So when Mayor Lionheart is being arrested, he makes some statements. 
at this point, we know that in the world of Zootopia, Miranda is a thing. Because Judy is literally telling him, you have the right to remain silent. And these rights that you read come from a case called Miranda v. Arizona, or Arizona v. Miranda. Uh, no, it's Miranda v. Arizona. Miranda v. Arizona. And in that case, the Supreme Court said everyone needs to be aware or reasonably apprised of several rights that they have, including the right to remain silent under the Fifth Amendment, the right which we call the right against self-incrimination, the right to a lawyer, which is actually a Fifth and Sixth Amendment right, the right to have a lawyer appointed for them if they cannot afford one. They're also apprised that things they say can be used against them if they say them. In this case, Judy is getting ready to Mirandize the mayor, and he starts making some statements. He says, you don't understand. I was just trying to protect the city. Judy is interrupted. She does not finish Miranda, and Judy says to him, no, you were just trying to protect your job, to which he then gives a more explicit statement of what he was doing, thus making incriminating statements. So when we look at statements, what we're talking about is the Fifth Amendment, which is your right to protection against self-incrimination. You don't have to tell the police anything. You can just stay silent. And if you choose to stay silent, me as the prosecutor, when you are on trial, cannot say, they didn't even tell the police what happened. I can't even imply it. And the jury is instructed that they can't use your silence against me, which your mileage may vary on. <laughs> Very frankly, you shouldn't stay silent. You should say a couple things. The very first one is, I am exercising my right to have counsel present. And the very second thing is, I am also exercising my right to remain silent because there is a line of cases out there that says they actually can bring up your silence unless you explicitly state you're exercising that right. Yes. I'm going to be the asshole, and what if I say something like, yo, I want a lawyer, dog? Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> that case was horribly decided. Uh, yeah, I agree, but... <laughs> that case, what, what he's referring to is there was a case that came out of Louisiana, uh, which was per curium affirmed, which means all the judges agreed on it. Nobody had to write a fucking opinion. All they had to say was affirm per curium. I, one asshole wrote an opinion. The suspect said, if you think that's what I'm doing, y'all can just get me a lawyer, dog. And the asshole judge wrote, well, his request for a lawyer, dog, was unclear because dogs aren't lawyers. <laughs> what? No, no, no. You're laughing? Let me tell you why this is a fucking problem, okay? The Supreme Court has held that if you request counsel as a criminal defendant, you must clearly and unequivocally express your desire for counsel. Mere statements that imply you may want counsel are not enough. If you think I'm guilty, y'all can just get me a lawyer. Take dog out of it. Does that sound clear and unequivocal to you? If you think I'm guilty, I want a lawyer. Not in Louisiana and not in the majority of the United States. If you think I'm guilty. That's where they put the emphasis. Not the last part. You can get me a lawyer. If you are arrested, clearly and unequivocally state, I want an attorney. That case, it's funny. I wrote about it. It's funny. It's an amusing image. That case was a grave miscarriage of justice, and the Supreme Court agreed. So one thing to keep in mind about what Boozy is saying, and this is very important, is that every state, while the minimum threshold for your protection is the U.S. Constitution, many states afford you more protections than the U.S. Constitution, and many states have interpreted their own constitution's rights of attorney, counsel, and to remain silent in a more, uh, in a more uh, defendant or suspect leaning focus. So while that is the federal rules and while Louisiana tends to break everything, mm -hmm. that is not necessarily the rule in your state. Right. But generally, or 
every time, if you are clear and unequivocal about what you want, the police have to stop interrogating you. Now, you can reinitiate conversation, and that's a different way that we sometimes get around that, but if you are clear and unequivocal, the police have to stop talking to you if you request an attorney. Lionheart's statements are interesting because he is making what I would call a spontaneous utterance. He is trying to explain himself before the police even talk to him. So if the police are arresting you and you are just going on and they haven't said anything to you yet, they haven't given you Miranda, they haven't asked you a question, none of those statements are suppressible. That's because for a statement to be suppressible, it has to be a response to a custodial interrogation. That requires two things. One, that you be in custody, and two, that the police be asking you questions. They have to be interrogating you. So in this case, it's clear Lionheart is in custody. He is handcuffed. He's being shoved into a patrol vehicle. They are reading him his rights. But he gives a statement. He is trying to explain himself. Those statements are all going to come in because those are what we call spontaneous utterances. They're not statements in response to questions. Now, after that, when Judy says, you were trying to protect yourself, she hasn't finished Miranda yet, and he responds to her. He says, you don't understand, and then he gives a far more incriminating statement. This is the one that's more subject to questioning because, one, Judy hasn't finished giving him his Miranda, and two, she's now interacting with him. She's saying something to him. You were trying to protect your, yourself, and he's responding to her. So, Boozy, did that violate his right to remain silent when she said that? Lionheart's a fucking moron. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> no, it did not at all. Uh, like you just said, spontaneous utterances of defendants in custody are not going to be thrown out. The only time that you really see that happen, where they try to say, oh, it was a spontaneous utterance, or we weren't interrogating them, they said it on their own, or situations where somebody, A, is in custody, which, uh, uh, I mean, custody is kind of easy. Can you leave? No? Okay, you're being detained. Most of your rights apply at that point. Uh, but it's custodial interrogation. It doesn't have to be at the police station, but it has to be in a situation where you are clearly not able to leave. Uh, the police have control over you to that extent and could put pressure upon you. Um, the second part of that, if you're going to overcome a spontaneous utterance, is you have to look at what the police were saying or doing at that time. There have been cases out there where like, they'll have somebody, a suspect, in a car, and they're looking, to, I think actually this is the casebook case on it, is they had a suspect in the back of a patrol car, he was in custody, they knew he, uh, he had children, they were looking for the murder weapon, and they knew they couldn't question him, because he'd already said, I'm not saying anything. And so they knew they couldn't question him. So the officers, as they were driving him to the station, discussed how there were a lot of children in the area, and how if one of those kids found that gun, they'd probably shoot somebody and someone would get killed and a child would lose their life. The officers knew what they were doing. They were doing this specifically to make the man feel bad enough to say something, at which point he did, and said, I don't want any kids to get hurt. Come on, I'll show you where the gun is, and incriminate himself. That did get thrown out. The court looked at that and said the officers knew exactly, even though they weren't asking him directly, they were intentionally trying to get him to make that utterance, and they knew what they were doing, so we're going to treat that as an interrogation. Otherwise, spontaneous utterances, uh, they're going to get in. And not only that, but why would I try to keep it out? Judy and Nick overheard the, uh, the entire conversation that he had with the doctor in there where he admitted to knowing the entire plan. He's got a prior admission in there. Uh, there's no point in me trying to keep it out. They didn't he's just a moron. It's on film. Yeah, he's a moron. Well, yeah, but at the same time, if I have to use Judy, then you get to cross. Oh, definitely. Judy. Oh, yeah. And he no. said all that stuff in front of Bogo, who yeah, I could just call. A, 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 I'm not going to keep it out. B, I would love to get Judy in. Uh, uh, Judy is the dirtiest cop on the force. <laughs> <laughs> One thing to keep in mind about everything we said about statements is that if Boozy wins the argument that it was illegal to search the lab. The statements are gone. Right, because I can't use evidence 
that's acquired as a result of an illegal search, and the mayor's arrest is a result of that search that would be deemed illegal. We call that fruit of the poisonous tree. I can't use evidence that is obtained by illegal means even once the next step has happened, even if legal steps happen between them, if the initial illegal act is the reason that the later legal acts can even happen, it's called fruit of the poisonous tree and it all gets suppressed. Yep. So let's move on to Doug. Doug is the RAM. And this is the PowerPoint, oh, no, not that one. No, no. This is the PowerPoint flow chart that you would love to see that goes through how he was arrested, but I'll try to paint a word portrait well, for once you. Once again, life changing PowerPoint. Life changing. Just, just, you don't know what you're missing. Just like, can you? Anyways, so it starts out early in the movie. They arrest Duke Weaselton. He has a bag full of uh, what appear to be turnips. And after arresting him, they pretty much lay dormant. Later, Machius, while they are interrogating him, says something about quote unquote night howlers. Again, lays dormant. After Judy quits the force, she goes home and she is with her dad and mom and uh, the lovely round Gideon, the lovely uh, beautiful fox who I'm daydreaming about <laughs> currently, says something about the legal name or the chemical name of those plants. It's Midnacampum halicanthius. And this is why I'm a lawyer and not a scientist. Yes, it is. <laughs> and then they discuss their psyche, uh, psychedelic effects. And her dad confirms that those are called night howlers. This leads them back into the city where they then kidnap and illegally interrogate Duke Weaselton by threatening to murder him. <laughs> Agents of ice. Yeah. Ice him. They then use the information they acquire from Weaselton to search uh, a subway laboratory. And during that search of the laboratory, Doug comes back in. He makes several incriminating statements. He is currently working on the drug that is driving the animals uh, feral. And he then proceeds, they proceed to confront him and they get in the chase that ends the movie. So we've got a couple things going on here. First of all, for the purposes of explanation, because Sage is sitting there judging me for uh, the way I presented this earlier, we're going to assume again that the laboratory in the sub, it was private property. That somehow Doug owned it, that somehow Doug leased that property from the city, that it's Doug's, that the police, that it wasn't just an abandoned facility and that they couldn't search it legally by another means. That just gives us the ability to talk about all the stuff that happened. We're also gonna assume that there's no real reason to believe that that subway car is going anywhere anytime soon. There's no real evidence that it's gonna be moved. So there's a couple things we have to talk about here. And the first thing is the fruit of the poisonous tree. All of the information after Weaselton is tortured and interrogated, can Doug suppress that? Now this goes back to that question of standing, right? Doug isn't Weaselton. Oh, I, no, I agree with you. <laughs> like this, by the way, take a picture. This is the only time a defense attorney will say it. No, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he can't suppress it. It, uh, it would be, I mean, we'll make the motion because you always make the motion. That, that's, that's the thing about law is even if you know you're going to lose, you make the motion uh, to suppress uh, on the same basis. And you'd argue that it firmly goes against public policy to allow the police to threaten to murder third parties to gain evidence uh, of, of that. Uh, however, I don't see it being kicked on that one. It does get kicked. Really? Just not on the constitutional grounds of the Fifth Amendment. Oh, no, 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 no. You're, that's, you're looking at yeah. a total Fourth Amendment so, matter. Yeah. yeah. So, no. It turns out that Doug doesn't have standing to challenge the arrest, or challenge the statement. But, but, and this is the important part, Police cannot use a coerced confession for probable cause. That's because the federal courts have found, and sadly there's no Supreme Court argument on it, but it's most of the circuits have now found 
a coerced confession cannot reasonably believe to be true. That means if you torture someone to get information, you cannot turn around and reasonably say that that information is accurate. So it still gets suppressed because they didn't have probable cause. It doesn't matter that later that information turned out to be true. What matters is what they could reasonably believe at the time to be true. It would not have been sufficient to gain a warrant. Right. So remember what we said about exigent circumstances. Exigent circumstances aren't enough alone. You have to have probable cause and exigent circumstances. In this place, in this time, the police did not have probable cause for that search. So, does Boozy win? I'm always going to say yes. So don't look at me. <laughs> like, do you win? What about yes. What about when they look in through the glass window and they see all of the plates? Oh! You're going to go to law school. <laughs> so you've talked, so uh, just to repeat that in case you didn't hear, um, lovely person in the front row said, what about when they look in the window and they see the plants? So this would go to what we call plain view. Arguably here, I would say even as the prosecutor, uh, though again, like Boozy says, you make the argument, I'm going to make the argument plain view, I probably lose on plain view. And that's because they have to climb up to look down into the open window. Plain view, usually, you have to be able to view in from a public area or somewhere where someone is reasonably going to be. So you have to be where you are lawfully. Uh, in this situation, wasn't there a gate in front of the subway entrance? Uh, okay, so there's a gate in front of the subway entrance. Assuming that that car is sitting on private property, is probably renting that area of track that it's sitting on as well. So why are the police even in the station? Would anybody be in there just to look in those windows? Unlikely. Uh, even then, if the police were to say, knock on your door tomorrow, and they do this, it's called knock and talk, uh, and open the door and they say, oh, we're just looking into some stuff around the neighborhood, we want to introduce ourselves. You will see the officer while they're talking to you doing this. What they're doing is they're looking behind you. They're looking behind you to see if there's anything back there. And they're doing it because once you have opened the door, they are in a place they are lawfully allowed to be on your front porch. And anything they see is within their eyesight. And there's nothing requiring them to have a warrant just to knock on the door and say hi. That's a voluntary interaction. Now, if they look behind you and they see a pile of heroin on your coffee table, <laughs> they're going to kick the rest of the door in place you in handcuffs and seize that heroin and it will all be admissible under a plain view doctrine. Plain view only applies to the areas, again, where you can legally be and that's typically going to be the front door and possibly the front porch. Everything else in your house is what's called curtilage. That's considered areas that are under your control that you have a reasonable belief in privacy. It usually means back, uh, the back of your house and anything that's enclosed by a fence. So do I lose? If there's no plain view, probably not. And Boozy has a phrase, and that's all prosecutors are dicks. Yep. <laughs> and I'm a prosecutor. Like he says that like I'm the only one who that. Trust me. Okay. Even the defense attorneys that are friendly with you, like the moment you leave, like what an asshole. Look, um, <laughs> people are not shy about calling me an asshole, uh, especially not in my work. I know. I'm um, one of the reasons is that we have a lot of tools to get stuff in when you wouldn't necessarily think we should be able to. We're talking about a search here that's the basis based in torture that is illegal, and I am still probably going to win because of something called the attenuation doctrine. The attenuation doctrine says that if intervening facts occur during the course of an illegal uh, action by the police, they may attenuate or and the Supreme Court of the United States uses this term, purge the taint of the illegal search. <laughs> purge the taint. By the way, that's the name of our after dark panel. <laughs> Whether the taint is purged is based on a three-part multi-factor balancing test. I have to use that phrase once. Courts look at three different things to determine if something attenuates. First of all is the temporal proximity of the illegal search to the intervening event. 
the closer in time, the less likely it is to attenuate. The second thing we look at is the present, what the intervening circumstances are, and these are called the attenuation factors. Strong attenuation factors can overcome close temporal proximity. And then the third, fact, uh, the third factor is the flagrancy of the misconduct. In this case, while they are in there, and they listen to Doug say, he talks about a new target, he's going to attack a cheetah in the middle of Zootopia Square. This action is an attenuating circumstance. Even though they're in there illegally, they're hearing him talk about a new crime. And because they're not interacting with him, all of this that they're witnessing is an attenuating crime. The presence or action or talking about a new crime is considered strong attenuation by the Supreme Court. So even though the other two factors weigh against me heavily, it's happening during the course of the illegal action, so there's no temporal displacement at all, it's happening at the same time, and the conduct of the police is extremely flagrant here, that strong of attenuation, witnessing the preparation for a new violent crime, is probably strong enough in this case to overcome the illegal search. I'm going to go right back there because your hand is raised first. Uh, does the attenuation have to be uh, documented, recorded, anything like that? Or can they just say, If you want to beat me, it does. <laughs> <laughs> what you're talking about is weight of evidence. So a police officer's statement is evidence. But in this case, my problem is, I've got to put a dirty cop on the stand and say, hi judge, believe what this dirty cop says she heard in that car, right? <laughs> I've got to say, Judy says, she overheard Doug saying this, and Boozy gets to say, Judy says a lot of things. <laughs> Do you know how many times I will say, so did you hear my defendant or my uh, client's alleged statement before or after you threatened to kill the weasel? <laughs> so what you're talking about is weight. If they have it recorded, that's strong weight to support what they say. If they don't, I've got to rely on my officer's credibility, which is going to be dependent on the judge and the jurisdiction. And some judges, in certain jurisdictions, will believe anything someone with a badge says. If Zootopia is in Texas, they're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> or Louisiana. In other jurisdictions, Police officer conduct does create problems. For instance, I will tell you, I used to work in a different jurisdiction than I work in now, and an officer routinely said that he pulled people over because their uh, license plate tag light was out. When was the last time any of you looked at your license plate tag to see if it was functioning or not? It is a reason you can be pulled over. He said this all the time. He pulled all these people over, and then someone who he pulled over decided to get out of his car and take a picture of the tag with the two other lights on and showed that he had lied. And from that moment on, our judge told us he would never believe another word that officer said. So every single case that that officer said, testified to, was basically a loss for us after that point. So some judges are extremely hard when they have evidence that an officer has lied but it's got to be pretty good evidence that that officer has lied to their face because judges have egos and lying to them is pretty good. But in a lot of jurisdictions, the word of the officer is going to be king. And do you still have a question? Didn't Judy hand in her badge when she went back so she would be considered an officer at the time? She would be a civilian attempting to report a crime? You want to get it? Mm -hmm. Even an officer who is not currently an officer acting in agency or as an agent of the police is still considered an official. I'm so happy you asked that question. I totally forgot to say and, anything about it. And it doesn't, it doesn't only go to that. You know those jailhouse informants that you always hear about? If the police talk to them and say, hey, talk to this guy, there's case law saying they're agents as well. Anybody acting on behalf of the police under some sort, some form of police sanction is acting as an agent of the police and most, if not all, constitutional restrictions do apply. And did you still have a question? I was going to say, like, what about Nick? Because he was acting as an Nick was acting as an agent. <clears throat> yes. 
Okay, I'd like to go back to uh, uh, Mayor Leinhardt's statement for a moment. Um, I think this is a clear case of artistic license where the uh, filmmakers were trying to balance uh, legal accuracy with um, their dramatic need to have Judy confront the mayor and to have him uh, go on his motive for him. Well, I mean, whether it was artistic license or not, the mayor still made the excited under. I mean, they got that part right. He would be, that statement would likely come in and he likely would be convicted based off of that statement. So, uh, and it's not artistic license because I, I hate to tell you all this, criminal defendants are morons. <laughs> I have had clients who have told the police exactly where the drugs are, who they belong to, and the amount of them, would ask something like, is there anything else in the car you want to tell me about? Which is a form question, by the way. Like, they don't really suspect there's something in the car the majority of the times. So they just ask it. Is there something in the car you need to buy? Well, I got a brick of marijuana in the trunk, officer. <laughs> I was driving it up to sell it to some underage kids at a preschool. <laughs> I've done it 24 times before, and here's my supplier's address. I mean, criminal defendants are morons. They talk. They don't know how to shut up. Most cases are going to end, and we've got to wrap up in just a second, so I'm going to get a little bit further, but most cases end uh, without ever going to trial. They end in what's called a plea. Plea is basically where I say, hey, this is what you're looking at in this case. This is what you could potentially go to prison for. I'm going to give you slightly less time if you don't take me to trial. The incentive to plea is real easy. We never know what a jury is going to do. Juries are crazy. And there is evidence that actually once you put more than three people together, their decision making skills, reasoning, and uh, ability to evaluate a situation goes down exponentially every person you add over three. And there are 12 people in a jury. <laughs> So even if I have a strong case, even if I've got a case where someone confesses, even if I've got the world's worst defense attorney on the other side, and I don't in this case, I still probably want to plead the case out. Because I never know what 12 people in a room are going to do. So that's my incentive to plead. What's your incentive to plead? In this, um, Lionheart, I have like as an attorney, I have none because he's well healed. Um, as as his attorney, uh, at the end of the movie, isn't he at the police graduation again? No, he's not. He's, he's not. Okay. He's in prison. He's in prison then. Okay. Well, he might I mean, but that's jail. that's one thing we have the incentive to plea because you don't want to spend a lot of time in on felonies, which he did kidnap a bunch of people. Uh, we've got a decent case to make for a plea here. He wasn't intentionally kidnapping people. He was trying to prevent a mass panic. That, may I add, did actually occur. Uh, to save the city and protect the citizenry, all of the citizenry. It wasn't a malicious act. It was a stupid act. Uh, but one that he felt had to be done in an emergency situation. If you can spin it like that and take a lesson plea, maybe a couple of years on him, uh, we're fine. Doug, fuck you. I'm not playing to anything. You guys are screwed on Doug. You got a cop who threatened to kill somebody. You got a guy who's working with flowers. Flowers that are illegal and can be sold openly to create things. You have a dirty cop who's saying they overheard a certain conversation. I'm confident taking that one to trial. You might get a misdemeanor, please. Misdemeanor? It's, it's, it's oh, 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 what are we talking misdemeanor? Are we talking probation or are we talking... Uh, how much time? Open to argue to the judge. Say what? Open to argue to the judge. No, 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 no. I open to argue. <laughs> we'll do six months home incarceration, three years probation. Man, you have never worked with an assistant who had a mean elected, have you? No. <laughs> All right, well, I'm not going to be able to authorize that plea through my elected, so I think we're going to trial on Doug. Uh, why don't you come back and give me a plea that's not open to it based on those lines? You know that's a minimum. I know that's a minimum. Now I want to hear what you're going for. I'm gonna go with. I'm gonna go with the conspiracy to commit assault. At the end of the movie. Okay. That's probably where I'm gonna go with it. What time are you looking at? Oh, well, let's see. In Kansas, that's a five. Thirty-seven months. 
assuming he doesn't have any other credit. 37 inside, come on. Yeah. Come on. Give him a year and a half inside, year and a half supervised release. I can't do that in Kansas, so sure. Whatever oh, you want. okay. You, you can't do that there? You can't actually split the sentence between inside and supervised release? No. Okay. What's your strategy? Well, you've talked a little bit about trial strategy, but at trial, we got like two minutes, so yeah. <laughs> what are you trying to do? It, it, with Doug? Well, with Lionheart, I'm, I, he's going to take a plea. He's going to take a lesson plea. Everybody knows that. He's going to direct us to take a lesson plea. He's not going to fight it. Uh, with Doug, see if I can't hang the jury or get enough evidence thrown out that you guys are comfortable making a plea. Probably three years would be reasonable on it, to be honest. My strategy, for the most part, as a prosecutor, is to just ignore him. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a reason for that. The worst thing prosecutors do is they get in a competition with a defense attorney. Yep. My job is to prove my case. It's not to disprove whatever he says. And the best job I ever do with a jury is when I'm telling my story and I get them to stop remembering that he exists. And my job is to poke holes in his story. It's not to prove my client's innocence. It's just to say you can't prove beyond a doubt he's guilty. And I think I said this to you earlier and I'll say it again. He's got to have 12. You know how many I need to get a tolerable plea deal? One. I just have to hang the jury, go back, and say retrying it is less of an advantage to you than making a deal with me now. Well, thank you for all for coming. We're out of time. Um, I'll stick around to answer some questions outside if you want to uh, ask. But uh, thank you again. This is a great panel, and you're a great crowd. Thank you very much. Silver Gato Man, he bought me a coffee. Silver Gato Man, here is the song for thee. He likes to video all the panels at the cons. You should go and watch them, whether they are short or long. Silver Gato Man, you video that's not a jibe. All of you go to his YouTube channel and like and subscribe.